Hi, listeners. This is Chris Batts, your host of the Law Firm Leadership Podcast. I just want to take a minute and say if you appreciate the podcast, the content being produced, and haven't already, please leave a review on iTunes. Uh, It would greatly help us with visibility. And if you don't use iTunes, please leave a review on Stitcher, Google Play, or YouTube. And as many of you already know, we interview corporate defense, law firm leaders, partners, and legal consultants. You are listening to episode number three of the Law Firm Leadership Podcast. Broadcasting from Kansas City, this is the Law Firm Leadership Podcast. In each episode, you'll receive actionable ideas and hear personal leadership stories of the top corporate defense law firms from around the United States. Enjoy a front row seat with law firm leaders, their partners, and legal consultants as we discuss life and leadership. Welcome to the Law Firm Leadership Podcast. I'm your host, Chris Batts with the Lion Group. Today, I have the pleasure of speaking with Eric Press of Bernero and Press. Eric Press is the former editor-in-chief of The American Lawyer, having been at ALM Media for 16 years. He also spent almost 19 years as a writer and editor at Newsweek prior to ALM. You mentioned, Eric, on your website that no other journalist, perhaps no other human being, has met with or watched more law firm and legal department leaders than you have. Now, being that you're post-ALM, you bring a fascinating perspective and market knowledge to being a law firm consultant with Wendy Bonero. Welcome, Eric, to the Law Firm Leadership Podcast. I'm delighted to have you as our guest. Thank you, Chris. It's a pleasure to be with you. Eric, let's talk about a subject you brought up prior to recording. And you mentioned, you know, you're seeing some trends with law firms as far as what they're doing right and maybe what they're not doing right, the success and the stagnation of law firms. Can you speak to that? Uh, Yes. Uh, What I have in mind is I, I, I see regular reports and I'm called frequently by journalists and, 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 and others talking about the, the so-called flat legal market and how nothing is up and everything is flat and et, et cetera, et cetera, and a, a lot of hand-wringing. What I notice when I unpack some of that data is that we're talking about averages there and that, yes, on average, the law firm, uh, the, the world of big law firms demand seems to be uh, flat or only up slightly. But if you look at individual firms, what you see is that there are firms doing above average and other firms doing below average. There are firms that are as busy as they've ever been, and there are other firms that are struggling uh, uh, mightily to make their way in the world. What sets them apart, it seems to me, a bunch of things, of course, but Primarily, what sets them apart is uh, the firms that are succeeding in what is in an admittedly difficult and competitive environment is that one, they these firms tend to be focused on what they do well and what the market thinks they do well, and two, they are involved with their clients. They have an understanding of what their clients want, where their clients are headed, what services they can provide to their clients to make their lives easier or resolve pressing problems, as opposed to firms that are struggling more, that are not focused, that are not sure of who they are or where they want to be or are sure of who they are, but their certainty doesn't match up with what the their clients and the market in general uh, may think of them. So this is a time, uh, I think, where members of the reality-based community are going to succeed far better than those who are counting on, um, uh, on, on the past or on hopes and dreams. Eric, do you have the liberty of sharing some examples of maybe both sides? Well, I don't, uh, one thing that Wendy and I and our part, my partners don't do is talk, uh, uh, specifically about, uh, uh, any of our clients. So I, okay. I, 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 I can't, I can't do that. But what I can tell you is that I go out into the market on a regular basis and I meet with law firm leaders who either on their own or through people such as myself spend lots of time talking with their clients. They do formal interview programs. They go and meet 
with with their peers, uh, either chief legal officers or CEOs. They ask questions not just about how they're doing, but they ask questions about what others are doing. They ask questions about where their clients are headed and what they anticipate their needs are going to be. This all seems rather basic, uh, but but the fact is that not all firms do this. Yeah. And it's, it, it's remarkable to me. I sit with general counsel who talk about how they have these annual luncheons uh, with partners who come by, with you know, so-called relationship partners who come by to check in once a year, once every 18 months, see, how, see what things are like. And rather, these general counsels say, than having a substantive conversation, too often it's a conversation that's, uh, you know, how about them Red Sox? And that's not hugely helpful to a busy client. Uh, I had one, one general counsel tell me that finally he had to seize control of this meeting to, to lay out what his agenda might be, uh, what was bothering him both about the relationship with the law firm, but more importantly about his, uh, the needs that he was being pressured to fulfill by his uh, business partners at his uh, Fortune 200 company. So, these are busy people who appreciate being asked about what's on their mind and how their lives can be made easier. Um, and the amazing thing is that it doesn't happen more often. It does happen in other lines of business. It does happen with other professional services organizations. For reasons that are both obvious and mystifying, lawyers and law firms seem to have some difficulty uh, having these conversations with their customers. And in this time where there is some evidence of restless customers, of a lack of tenure, it seems like a mistake not to work more closely uh, uh, with with your customer base. And when you say work more closely, I mean, you mentioned an annual frequency. What other industries are doing? What, what do you recommend? Is this something work with your clients or try to set up? Look, this is a, perhaps an inapt example, but I haven't uh, taken a plane and I travel a lot. I haven't uh, bought something of some significance where within 48 hours, I'm not either being asked for by, a, by phone or email by the service provider uh, how they did, what did I think of their service, what could they do better, uh, et cetera. It's almost a, um, it's, in some cases, it's almost an annoyance. And that's for a $500 uh, plane ticket or a $1,000 visit to a car dealership. It, you, if you're spending $500,000 on, on, a, on, a, on a law firm who you regard as potentially uh, a trusted advisor, one would think that at the end of that engagement, to say nothing of along the way, there would be a conversation either between the relationship partner or the head of the law firm or an outside consultant such as myself sent in to take a temperature as to how well the service provider provided their services mm -hmm. and what could they do better. You know, and in some industries, I've heard this as a kind of a feedback loop. Is that correct? Yes, the, uh, a feedback loop, which then not only leads to information about how you did on the past project and opportunities for new projects, but presumably if you're paying attention and taking, uh, behaving in a mindful way, you're learning about your process and how it's, your client perceives it, and you might make an improvement. Uh, as issues are identified of what you could do better or what you could do faster, what's not understood, that's, that's rich data. Uh, that's, we, we hear a lot about big data. Big data has its, has its place perhaps, but for lawyers and their clients, nothing is richer, more valuable than understanding what your customer really appreciated, really needs, and really liked or didn't. And Eric, are you saying that this might be this one of the single most important things law firms are doing to continue winning success with their clients? Well, it's certain, 
performing high quality legal services is probably the most important thing that they can do. But that is largely taken as a given. Yeah. Uh, no one doubts, no, no client I've met doubts that the lawyers they're, they're using uh, are adequate or more than adequate to any task at hand. Uh, if that's a problem, the, the lawyer has a real problem. But beyond that, they want to talk about service and their needs and how they want to want to have have their needs met. And yes, that is a, a very important aspect to getting uh, and, and deepening relationships with important clients. Yeah, when you talk about kind of the flat line of growth or improvement among law firms, you do see firms maybe implementing this, and they have a much different. Uh, trajectory than you mentioned of stagnation. Is there anything else besides kind of this feedback loop that is or isn't happening that you would speak to? Let's think about the world as we know it. It is growing more complex. Uh, there seems to be no shortage of regulation or new efforts by regulators to enforce them. Uh, despite the talk of the election we're not about to become a uh, an American only commercial operation. Yeah. Uh, our businesses are operating a, a, across borders and in jurisdictions that 20, 30 years ago they never dreamt of. So across the board, in a more complex, more regulated, more international, more cross border, cross jurisdiction world, it would seem to me that. The demand, the need for appropriate legal help, far from shrinking, would be increasing. Mm -hmm. And if that's true, then the question becomes, who is meeting that demand? Now, sometimes that work is going in-house. Some corporations have the ability to uh, get more, more work out of their in-house departments. Sometimes that work is going to new providers or the legal process outsourcers or the accounting firms, particularly outside the United States. Yes and yes. But in fact, there is a need for this work uh, to get done. And the only and the firms that understand the work that needs to get done and what their clients <laughs> uh, forgive me, I'm, I'm, I'm laughing at myself. What, what I'm saying, Chris, seems so painfully obvious. Uh, if you if you are going to focus on anything, it would seem to me that firms would want to focus on uh, two things: their their strongest practices, and their strong, and secondly, their strongest practices that uh, fulfill the needs of their of their clients. And it's a it, it, it's not just a feedback loop; it's a kind of a virtuous circle in which uh, you you provide something that the market wants to buy, and the market wants to buy it, and you provide it. And I'm not sure whether the chicken or the egg comes first, but you work on both ends, on understanding both ends uh, uh, simultaneously. Am I being clear? Yes, absolutely. I mean, obviously, I, I, I have to agree with you that this is how business works. It's someone needing something, someone providing it, and making sure that both relationships are being met uh, in the way it should be. But let me pivot a little bit because you, you did bring up the notion of competition. And definitely outside of the U.S. market, there's <laughs> there's unique competition. I mean, you have the, the ABS. I believe that's correct. Yeah, ABS and the U.K., alternative business structures. You have the public accounting firms, you have publicly traded law firms, you have companies like Axiom shaking up the market. I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Well, uh, Axiom for one is a fascinating uh, and, and as best I can tell, successful experiment in finding a, a gap in the corporate legal market and filling it. Filling it initially with Highly talented and motivated part-time lawyers who could be hired either directly by clients or or by law firms to fill particular needs, and then secondly, as a as an agency that could take on entire tasks 
for corporate clients um, from beginning to end as a kind of outsourced uh, subcontractor to the legal department or another department within the company. Uh, so Axiom has been uh, a, a great success, and there's some question as to uh, where it would rank as if, if it were a law firm, where where it would rank in the M Law 200 or NLJ uh, uh, 350 uh, with, with gross gross revenues of, of more than 200 million. It would be well up there uh, in, in, in the M Law second hundred, and that's quite quite an uh, achievement. The inter- another interesting question about Axiom, though, is whether others will be able to uh, uh, follow it and why others haven't been able to follow it at the size and scale that Axiom uh, ha- ha- has so far achieved. I don't know the answer to that, uh, frankly. There's a whole host of legal process outsourcers out there Many of them focusing on uh, e-discovery and due, due diligence work. There's a whole host of temp lawyer, contract lawyer providers, uh, but for the most part, they're not doing the sort of sophisticated work that that Axiom is doing. It's Axiom clearly has the first mover advantage and clearly has uh, a remarkably talented. Uh, leadership cadre, um, whether it's the you know, proverbial unicorn or whether others will be able to successfully uh, uh, copy it at, at real scale, uh, you know, really remains to be seen. What's curious about uh, about the absence of others rushing uh, to, to, to follow Axiom at, at, at that size is that it's allowed a variety of law firms, both in the U.S. and the U.K., to open their own experimental offices where they provide services uh, at, at lower rates and with with their same imprimatur, but with with back offices uh, uh, arranged in second or tertiary cities uh, and attempting to meet client needs and attempting to fight off the advent of uh, the, the, the the new the new models. The problem with the new models uh, is that so much is is expected of them uh, that they need more time. They need the ability, frankly, for some of them to fail. Uh, this thing is going to ha- take a little while to work itself out. Clearly. For the the non brain surgery work, there is room for these uh, these firms to in the market, and clients will will serve, take take the opportunity to work with them directly. Whether there are ever going to be enough of them, and it's such mass that they are going to topple a significant number of the major elite law firms in the U.S. or around the world. At, at this point, that's a little a, a, a little hard to foresee. For certainly. And I know that a lot of law firm leaders, some of them are probably paying attention to what's happening here, but it's not about the case, you know, about the company cases. And so I know that, but it, it's been rumored that Axiom is going after larger state deals, doing full-on M&A transactions. And so... Yeah, it's curious to see to what end do they hit a ceiling or are they fully competing with the white shoe firms of New York? We'll see. I I think that there will always be room for the elite firms of New York and the other major money centers. Uh, It's hard to imagine them being toppled. Whether Axiom can become one of them, that's a a pretty big leap. Let's see what happens. Yeah. But, but, but one one of the things you, we, we all have to understand here, and, and coming out of legal journalism, I I, I I plead guilty to it, is that there this is a market that there, for all the talk about change, et cetera, it, has, it it doesn't change that much. It hasn't been disrupted the way 
publishing or the record industry or entertainment uh, uh, or, or even taxi cabs uh, has, has been. Therefore, whenever there's a sign of change, however far on, on the margin that it might be, there is a whole lot of hooting and hollering. Conferences are arranged. New newsletters are created. The end is near. Uh, shrieks go go up. The sky is falling. Oh my goodness! Oh my goodness! Things are happening, and things will continue to happen. And the advent of artificial intelligence, which we're just at the beginning of, will make some profound changes. And the ways in which LPOs and law firms are rearranging, reconfiguring the way they're using their talent will bring changes. But Unlike some other businesses, the the, the law firm world uh, is is adapting more slowly because it's had the privilege of adapting more more slowly. In part because their clients, for the most part, are not legal market revolutionaries. They're business executives and business lawyers who have problems on their desks that they need solved. Yes, they'd like them solved more efficiently. Yes, they'd like them solved uh, more inexpensively if possible. But fundamentally, they want them solved. So the really clever law firms will be the ones that can not only solve the problems, and the, but also will find ways to do perform their tasks more efficiently, thereby rewarding both the client with more value in, in their bills and their partners with continuing high profit margin. Yeah. Eric, let me throw another question at you. And it's a trend that has come up since the UK has allowed uh, the ABS uh, legislation to come through. Have you been tracking or following the ABA resolution 105 for private ownership of law firms? I'm not aware of number 105. I'm aware of what the ABA is doing, but forgive me, I, I, I don't know what 105 refers to. That's okay. It's, uh, it's, I, I think it's their, um, their own governing body of documentation and legislation, I guess, to try to have discussion around, um, the idea of allowing, um, private ownership of law firms. Yeah. I'm, I'm curious what your thoughts are on that. Well, my thoughts are that absent uh, either a, a federal legislation of some kind or a remarkable uh, sea change in uh, the, the 10 largest states in the country, I, I, I think it'll be a non-starter. Mm. Yeah, it, it's, uh, it's fascinating to see. Do you, do you think it'll actually require federal regulation? No, I don't think it would require it, but... Uh, the, the, and in fact, it would be rather controversial to, to, to have federal legislation. But the the, the fifty states uh, regulate the the practice of law with, with, within their boundaries, um, and getting <laughs> getting those fifty states to agree on almost anything it, it, it individually could take a a very uh, long time, longer than either you or I. Uh, uh, m m might have for so you'd have the I mean the interesting problem of, of the large firms which nearly all of which but not all of them uh, operate in more than one state could what would they do with their Chicago office if uh, if, if Illinois goes one way on that uh, and, and New York on another um, I w which is why there have been discussions mostly in private about the possibility of getting the 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 the, the congress involved which again seems like quite a stretch quite a stretch um, whether there's going to be an appetite on the part of the large corporate firms to take outside investment uh I, I, I again remains to be seen. I, I remember well the enthusiasm uh, before Arthur Anderson blew up, and the accountants uh, were beginning to bang the drums of uh, having global 
law practices and, and someday attempting to uh, get the rules changed in the states and buy up some big globally based uh, U.S. based firms, there was in some executive committees uh, some interesting conversations about uh, could they go the way of of the great uh, the great investment banks and, and 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 somehow one way or another sell out or go public or take take um, outside money. That that those conversations came to a screeching halt with the Enron disaster and the and the collapse of Arthur Anderson. Uh, it's been well more than a decade. The accountants are back being interested, whether or not uh, we'll, we'll live to see it in 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 this country. I think is very very hard. I don't even think it's an open question. I think it's extremely un, un, un unlikely. The one area where having publicly outside money, public money coming into, pardon me, private investor money coming in, in, into the private practice of law that might be helpful would be to extend legal services to the, to those who currently can't afford it, uh, at, the, uh, on the theory that what, uh, the American consumer is waiting for is a is an H and R block like creation for legal services that that would require uh, intense investment in both technology and real estate uh, that probably would require money coming from outside the 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 pockets of the of, of the individual lawyers involved. Um, it, it, but again. I, I, I'm skeptical if, 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 if we'll see it, uh, but that's just one man's opinion. Yeah, just appreciate your insight. I know you've been watching the legal industry for several years now, so curious. You know, and it, you bring up the accountants and the opportunism that they see. I, I think it leads to uh, another question I wanted to ask you about ever since I thought about considering having you on the podcast. The ALM or ALM media, the American lawyer has always been equated with, uh, the AMLAW 100, AMLAW 200, National Law Journal 350. It's now the 500, the global 100. I mean, these are rankings that for better or for worse has had significant influence on, uh, the industry. And, um, I know when we were talking earlier that you weren't a part of the genesis of it at the beginning, but you know, I, I have a lot of questions around it. You know, while you were there, were you, as far as editor in chief, were you part of overseeing the uh, the collection of that data? Yes, that was that was certainly part of my responsibility, and and I was the guy who who took the AMLA one hundred and made it the AMLA two hundred. Did you? And, okay, and helped invent uh, the global one hundred rankings and. Uh, it, it, it seemed like natural extensions of, uh, of, of, of the MR 100, which is lost now to the pages of history, which started as the MR 50. So, and, you what, know, what going to, but small. Yeah. Yeah. Going to the 200, was that met with open, open arms? Was, were firms resistant to doing that? Uh, some were, others were uh, quite delighted to uh, find a way to be recognized by a national publication. It, yeah. it gave them some bragging rights. Uh, may have helped a little bit with 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 recruiting. Certainly helped uh, regional firms uh, be be more prominent uh, in 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 their regions. Um, Eric, you know. Um I think you may know this. I've got a public accounting background and as an auditor, how do you guys get comfort around the accuracy of those numbers? Well, one way we get comfort is o o over the years, we've, uh, we've compared them with the numbers that have been given to, uh, to our friends at Citibank. Citibank doesn't, um, doesn't get numbers from all 200 firms, but they get them from, I forget now, 130, 140 of them. And they don't share which 130, 140 are, are their participants in their survey, but it's a, it, it's, it's a good sample. And what we found consistently, uh, both publicly and privately 
is that in most of the categories, the numbers were within one, two, three, five percent of each other. Hmm. The the one area, and that would be for gross revenue, headcount, revenue per lawyer, contribution per lawyer, value per lawyer. The one area where there was controversy, and I imagine there might continue to be, would be the number uh, profits per partner. Uh, and yeah. there was a, there was a real difference there. Uh, although the majority of the numbers were, again, within 5% of each other. But there was a significant difference there with uh, with some firms. And partly that was because um, American Lawyer and City did not have the same definition of, of equity partner. Um, and partly, I suspect, it was because um, people, a few firms, uh, chose to mislead the American lawyer, um, <laughs> most notably uh, the old Dewey and LaBeouf firm. Right. Um, just just one example. So there is a limit to our ability to our, their ability to check these numbers. You could call a lot of people and, and attempt to pin them down. Uh, but the really compelling point is how relatively few of the numbers were were challenged and how uh, upright and honorable uh, most of the firms were about most of the categories. So I know that the law firm industry obviously is not regulated by the SEC, um, and it's right. kind of self-regulating. The ABA has some influence. Um, I mean, obviously, they, they have quite a bit at different times, but... You know, was it ever considered an option to can put out there a requirement for audit? Well, uh, that that would be as likely to happen as uh, <laughs> as giving journalists subpoena power. The, the, yeah. the, the, this power, this problem, could all go away with, uh, with 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 that. I mean, th there was an issue at, at one point. Various people suggested that. Uh, both internally and externally, that Am AMLAW go to a system of, of designating which uh, which firms cooperated or which firms uh, gave us numbers that they would confirm with, with with an independent audit, and there were some that did that. We chose not to do that uh, because our the, the numbers are gathered either from cooperating firms who just simply turn over the numbers or from firms that that don't cooperate and the reporters have to go out and 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 report the numbers as best they can thank god sometimes for unhappy spouses who are involved in divorce cases but there's a third category of firm that uh cooperates but prefers for their own reasons, and I never quite understood the reasons fully, uh, to not acknowledge that they cooperate. Hmm. So, so were the magazine to uh, begin to mark who's cooperating and who's not, uh, we'd either have to out people, yeah. they would have to out people who uh you know, out of source essentially, uh, or uh, lie to the lie to the reader and put somebody who's cooperating in the non-cooperating uh, category. So it just seemed like an impossible position, both for the magazine and the firms involved. So we uh, we we concluded that, that we would not do that uh, in the methodology that the American Lawyer used to publish, and I assume still does. It was very clear uh, that some firms cooperated and other firms were based on uh, were, were based on estimates. Uh, it wasn't the same as a filing with the SEC. Um, it 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 is what it is. It's interesting. So, has other types of measurements came up for discussion to try to get information from the firms? I mean, you guys don't have any balance sheet information, and I think that's a pretty curiously piece of information for people to know about. Has has things, other measurements, come up for discussion? 
Well, over the years, there's been a, a variety of, uh, of, of, of additional measures that, that, that have come along um, uh, related to the, the, the spread between the highest paid and lowest paid yeah. partner, uh, the number of hours, median, mean, highest and lowest, uh, a variety of things like that, which when we would ask for this information when I was still with the American lawyer, we weren't sure if we would get it. And to our delight, uh, a fair number of firms would cooperate, but but fewer would cooperate. And the more questions that were asked, the more categories of information that were requested, uh, the fewer firms would would cooperate. Uh, uh, as as we went along, and and so there's a point of a point of di- diminishing returns. Um, you know, it, 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 it's interesting to me and somewhat unpredictable what firms will 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 talk about there. When when research was done into funded and unfunded pension plans, uh, there was some amazement at the number of firms that would. Uh, talk about their situation and and some disappointment in the number of firms who would cooperate with other things but would but wouldn't talk about that so it's a little hard um it's a little hard to predict and, and now that I'm on the other side uh and talking with firm leaders as their aide and confidant not as the r- reporter editor and occasional tormentor i can understand uh the swirl of forces that are uh, impinging on their ability to answer otherwise uh, innocent and interesting questions, uh, both from us, at, not us, no, not, no longer us, both from people at the American Lawyer and uh, survey uh, jockeys at a, at a whole variety of places. Uh, so, you, so you get to see the other side, which, you know, is shedding light um, into your world. You know, I, I wanted to it's bring up. It's just amazing. I mean, it's, so yeah. come as no surprise to you, but it's just amazing how much more candid my conversations are yeah. <laughs> now that I'm no longer in publishing. <laughs> I can imagine it's a lot more candid. <laughs> yeah. And I appreciate it. Yeah. I can imagine. So I'm curious about, and I, I know you know who this individual is I'm about to mention, and he's no longer the chairman of KNL Gates, but Peter Kalis led an interesting line of leadership for just kind of full disclosure of financials. I'm curious on your take on that. Well, I, I, uh, have great admiration, uh, for Pete and, and think he did a wonderful job, uh, at K and L Gates. Um, uh, I think that what he was uh, trying to do, um, with his annual reports were on the whole, uh, was, was a positive step forward. Uh, as I, as I told him, uh, at the time, I, my, my only complaint was that, um, he wasn't as comfortable taking some questions about <laughs> some of, some of, uh, some of the annual report as, as, as I would have wished. But, you know, it was, a, it was an interesting effort and, and one that, uh, has largely not, not been followed. Yeah. And would it, it seem like that would be a further interest if, it, it, I mean, we, we noticed that no one else kind of followed his leadership. He was kind of a lone voice uh, for transparency. And as you said, maybe not a whole lot of response to questions, but at least it was out there. Um, it was out there. And, and Pete deserves enormous credit for taking seriously the opportunities of being the leader of one of the 10 largest firms uh, in the world and using his influence to try to advance uh, the conversation, both for the good of the law firm and the the general uh, legal community. I mean, from his vantage point, uh, and I think correctly so, he had a story to tell about his firm and their remarkable growth and success over uh the, the, the prior 10 years. And this was another way for him to, to get that message out. Uh, and, and he used it. Uh, it was, 
it, it wasn't an entirely selfless act, nor nor should it have been. Yeah, it d- definitely shouldn't. And yet, I, I know his leadership will be missed. He had a real public facing image. Yep. Uh, putting yourself out there is never easy to do. So I know he'll, he'll be missed for that. Pete, Pete's only public flaw was his ardor for the Steelers. For, for the Steelers? Yes. <laughs> Well, I, uh, I I guess that leads me to ask you a question. Um, who are you reading for uh, this past week? I'm originally from Cleveland. Um, oh. I've uh, never seen uh, the Cleveland baseball team. I've never seen the Tribe win a World Series. I'm not sure I ever will. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but it, it was wonderful that they, they played as well as they did. And if they had to lose to anyone, I'd glad they had to lose to the Cubs, but yeah. to be honest, I'm tired of them losing and yeah. would like to see them win. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, maybe they'll, uh, they'll do what the Royals did, um, and take it next year. That would, that would be, that, that, that would be sensational. Uh, I, I would rather not, uh, be one of those people, uh, uh, at, at, at age ninety, uh, photographed in the you know in the New York Times, being wheeled into a, a baseball game in the hopes that <laughs> I can see Cleveland win before my last breath is <laughs> taken. Yeah, I was amazed to see how many people were doing that. So, knowing that you're not in Ohio anymore, uh, in your backyard, who do you root for? Oh, in baseball, I, I root for uh, Cleveland. And I have a little bit of affection uh, for the Mets, being a, an original American League fan. Though rooting, rooting for the Yankees is, uh, while I admire their <laughs> their record, it's it's just impossible. <laughs> Are you a football fan as well? Is there other sports of interest? If the Browns played football, I I would be rooting for them, but I, I prefer to think about the the, the Cavaliers. Uh, okay. Yeah, so baseball, basketball. Well, let me jump to another question. This is a little more personal. Eric, I mean, you've, you've seen a lot. You've worked for two major publications, media companies, and and now you're kind of on the other side of the, the table in relationship with clients. Who's inspired you to do all this? Who, do you have any heroes? Do I have any heroes? Yeah. In my current role, I, I have uh, friends who were consultants working with law firms before I got into that this work and I've ad- admired what they what they did um, but I because I'm because I'm a little grown up to have uh, have heroes I um, I don't think of any of my my, my, my consultant um, models as uh, as as heroic uh, in, in terms of heroes in, in the world um, I I always admired, or for a long time admired, uh, people like um, uh, Jack Greenberg, who, who who just died, who succeeded Thurgood Marshall as the head of the NAACP uh, Legal Defense Fund, uh, and uh, John Doerr, who, who died a few years ago, who when he was um, uh, in the Justice Department, helping to run the Civil Rights Division in uh, in, in Bobby Kennedy's Justice Department mm-hmm. long, long ago, uh, you know, risked his life going out into the in, 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 into the streets of the segregated South, separating uh, uh, d- demonstrators and those who were wishing them harm personally by putting his uh, his physical presence. Uh, between them, those are people uh, who I deeply admire, and it was a great privilege when I was at the American Lawyer, and we had had Lifetime Achievement Award uh, celebrations to to hand each of them a Lifetime Achievement Award. They were they were the best examples of what lawyers could do for the. Common wheel and 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 for the republic, I have great admiration and 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 regard their work as heroic. The 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 men and women of the AMLA 200 who do vast amounts of public service of 
of pro bono work uh, at, a, at a time when it isn't always uh, encouraged and it's certainly not commercially uh, accumulative, but they feel that they are part of a profession that that is not only learned, but has an obligation to their fellow citizens to behave um, in a positive way, in a constructive way, extending the rule of law to those who otherwise can't afford it. Those people, both those I know and those who are who are nameless, who do everything from uh, death penalty work to sitting in uh, in adoption clinics to running, helping to run asylum cases for the refugees in our midst, those are the heroes of uh, of the bar, and I, I'm privileged to have known many of them, and uh, it's an honor to have written about some of them and to admire their work uh, close up and, and, and from afar. Yeah, truly, truly important to honor them and grateful for the law firms allowing them to give back. Really grateful. Eric, for you, how are you consuming content these days? Are you a like to have paper in your hands, newspaper reader? Do you listen to podcasts or do audiobooks? Well, uh, sort of all of the above. I, I continue to have a, the New York Times delivered uh, to my house, but I'm also as likely to, because I'm on the road a good deal, to be reading the the Times, the Washington Post, and the Wall Street Journal online or on my on my handheld. I you know read the New Yorker and the Atlantic. But even though the paper copy is coming, I'm mostly reading them on my on my iPhone. Um, books, serious books. I, I continue. I, I find it easier to read on paper. Mm. Entertainment. I, I read on my uh, on uh, on my Kindle. I, I listen uh, probably more faithfully than I should to. To podcasts late at night when I'm too tired to read, it's, it's a way for me to keep up with what's going on in the in the sports and, and cultural worlds. Uh, yeah, any um, any of those titles you care to the voice, any books or authors or podcasts you care to give name to? Oh well, there's a there's a wonderful sports talk uh, uh, show that ESPN does that they put out as a as a podcast called "Pardon the Interruption." Tony Kornheiser and Michael Wilbon. It's Funny and, and and smart and and uh, keep help, help helps keep me up to date. There's a Slate political podcast once a week that I get a get get a kick out of. There's a Slate cultural gap fest podcast that's quite good. The New York Times weekly book review podcast is uh, uh, very very good as well. Those are the, the, those are the ones I. I, I, I listen to regularly uh, David Axelrod, the uh, former Obama uh, advisor and, and political consultant, is now out at the University of Chicago, and he he brings uh, a, a bunch of uh, politicians and journalists and consultants to Chicago to to talk to his students and can, manages to get them on a podcast uh, about an hour a week. Uh, and they're, I find that quite, quite entertaining um, and, and and intriguing. He's had some excellent folks on, so uh, that's that that's a, a, a reasonable a, a reasonable list. I subscribe, I, I download others, but but don't have the time generally to, to to listen. Eric, I tend to ask every person I'm interviewing this question: What are some items maybe less on your bucket list? Well, uh, I'd love to go to, I'd love to go to India. I'd love to, uh, I'd love to break 90 on a golf course. <laughs> uh, and if I'm lucky enough, I'd like to see my grandchildren graduate from college. Yeah. And career wise, if, uh, if you weren't a journalist and you're not a consultant, say for law firms, what else would you do? Money when is not an object. Well, uh, I loved being a journalist. I went to law school and was a member of the New York Bar, but saw no 
no reason to 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 practice. America didn't need another average lawyer. I thought I love to bake bread. You know, uh, maybe I maybe I'd be a bread baker. A bread baker. Okay. Yeah. I like that. So my final question, and it comes from Kai Rizdal of Marketplace uh, uh-huh. dot org. In five words or less, Eric, what is your job, or what do you do? Five five words or less. Not sure if I can do it in five words, but uh, I I I help lawyers and law firms um, meet the needs of their clients. Thank you, everyone who listened to this episode of the Law Firm Leadership Podcast. If you like this podcast, please leave a review on iTunes. If you want to leave a review and don't use iTunes, feel free to do that with Stitcher, Google Play, or YouTube. Also, please share our podcast with others. Um, You can do that via email or social media. To share our podcast, to listen to it, to find other shows, to read the transcription of this audio, go to liongrouprecruiting.com forward slash podcast. Thank you for listening to the Law Firm Leadership Podcast. This podcast is for education purposes only. This content cannot be used for commercial use without written permission from the Lion Group. If you like this podcast, leave a review on iTunes.